Jujutsu Kaisen has a lot of deaths. In fact, it has so many deaths that it can be hard to keep track of the important ones, let alone the unimportant ones. So today I'll be covering every single one so that you have no issues with remembering them. We'll be going in the order that the deaths happen in the series, which means Wasuke Itadori is the first person we have to talk about. Even though we only saw the man for like 10 seconds, his death is surprisingly important. His dying message to Yuji is a major factor in why our protagonist became the protagonist. As far as we know, his actual death is the result of an illness which got to him in his elderly years. After this, we have some pretty unimportant deaths. It's the students that bullied Junpai, Sayama, Honda, and Nishimura. All three of these goons were killed by Mahito for talking during a movie, and Junpai just happened to be there as well, connecting the desperate student and the curse. While we're on the subject of Junpai, we might as well talk about his mom, Nagi. Nagi's death is one of the sadder in the series. She had no attachment to the world of Jujutsu and seemed like a pretty well-adjusted adult who provided for her son as a single mother. Sure, she wasn't perfect, but the death brought to her by Sukuna's finger definitely was not deserved, as it was basically a ploy by Mahito to accelerate his hold on Junpai. It's just one of the many examples of how terrible Mahito is. And so is the death of Nagi's son, Junpai. After facing Yuji in combat and ultimately committing to go to Jujutsu High School with the student, Junpai is quickly turned into a transfigured human by Mahito, killing him instantly. This is done solely because Mahito wants to talk to Sukuna and is attempting to force Yuji into a binding vow, but it doesn't work because Sukuna wants to watch Yuji suffer and he also can't heal damage done to the soul like that. As a result, Junpai dies for basically no reason, but it's not like he would have been a strong sorcerer anyway. After Junpai's death, we actually have no more deaths until the end of season 1, where we have the deaths of Esso and Kichizu, two of the death's paintings. These two brothers are killed by Yuji and Nobara after they attempted to recover one of Sukuna's fingers. While these two were not that important to the series, they did cry, and this changed Yuji's perspective on the brothers quite a bit. From here, we move into Jujutsu Kaisen Zero, where we start with Rika Orimoto, who got hit by a car. We do not know the exact circumstances behind why she died this way, whether it was a drunk driver or she was just stupid and walked in front of a car is unknown to us. Regardless, because of her connection to Yuda and Yuda's naturally high cursed energy, Rika's death led to her becoming a vengeful cursed spirit which attached itself to Yuda and became the Queen of Curses, one of the strongest curses we have ever seen. The creation of the Queen of Curses led to a number of deaths, but only one of them is important, and that is the death of Geto Suguru. While Rika didn't kill Geto directly, she did critically injure him, destroying one of his arms and forcing him to flee battle. And this is precisely when the special grade ran into Gojo. After a short conversation where they reflected on each other's lives, Geto is killed by Gojo, ending their decade-long feud. However, Gojo did not dispose of Geto's body properly, as he did not want to force Shoko to cremate it, and he didn't want to do it himself either. As a result, a certain other sorcerer would get their hands on it, and so Geto's body would continue to live on. Jujutsu Kaisen Zero does have one other death, but it's super insignificant. It's just that guy that seemed like a donator for Geto's cult. After he stopped contributing, Geto just let some curses munch on his face until he died. While we're on the subject of Gojo and Geto, we might as well talk about hidden inventories, where there are two major deaths. The first is, of course, Riko. Riko dies by Toji's hand, as he has a contract with the star religious group who wants the plasma star vessel dead in order to force Tengen to evolve. Past that, her death acts as a catalyst for Gojo and Geto, changing their points of view on Jujutsu and responsibility. It's also around this time that Riko's maid, Mizado, also dies, also by the hand of Toji. And if you're annoyed thinking about how much Toji messed up in this arc, do not worry, because he is the next to die. See, Toji made a classic mistake, letting his ego drive his will to fight, which results in him losing to the newly awakened Gojo. Even he is disappointed by his choice to fight Gojo, as he believed that he let go of such pride. Unfortunately, the glory of killing the strongest sorcerer in the modern era was too tantalizing for him to resist, and he perished as a result. He then died again in Shibuya after reincarnating from Ogami's seance technique. This death comes after he makes contact with Megumi during the duo's fight. The physical contract seems to trigger some sort of reaction, and after asking Megumi his last name, Toji stabs himself in the skull, ending his life with a look of satisfaction. This is likely because he realized just who he was fighting, and he was happy to see that his son turned out alright, but he did not wish to fight him anymore, as he knew his body only desired carnage. So he turned his bloodlust on the strongest person in the area. 
himself. But we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves talking about Shibuya. First we have to talk about the evening festival which led to the death of Kokichi Muda aka Mekamaru. Mekamaru put up a strong fight against Mahito in his absolute mode, but even with his 17 years of cursed energy saved up, he couldn't really do anything against the special grade, and he couldn't achieve his goals either. He would sort of live on in the form of his little surveillance spots, but that's about it. Okay, now we can get into Shibuya with a pretty insignificant death, the grasshopper spirit. This guy died while guarding one of the stakes for the barriers, but besides that he didn't really do anything. Surprising for such a clever guy. Another somewhat insignificant death is Ogami's, who was killed by the reincarnated Toji with literally zero effort. Her grandson would also die due to Toji taking over his body. His death is mostly insignificant, unlike the next death, which is Hanami's. Hanami is the first disaster curse to die, and it is ultimately her own stupidity that does her in. Instead of maintaining her domain amplification, Hanami believes the correct move is to use her curse technique against Gojo. But really, this is exactly what he wanted, and he used this opportunity to rip out her eyes before absolutely vaporizing the cursed spirit with just his cursed energy. Not too long after, another disaster curse falls. This time, it's Dagon. To be honest, Dagon mostly got unlucky. Like, he 100% could have beaten Nanami and crew. It just so happened that he had to run into one of the few people stronger than him who also acquired the perfect cursed tool to destroy the octopus. Dagon dies to Toji after sustaining massive damage from the sharpened ends of Playful Cloud. Pretty much right after Dagon's domain collapses, two more people die. This time, it's Nanako and Mimiko. They feed Yuji one of Sukuna's fingers, and when combined with the ten that Jogo feeds him, it is enough for the King of Curses to temporarily gain control over Yuji's body. This ultimately results in a number of deaths, with the first being Mimiko for trying to control Sukuna, and the next being Nanako who dies right after when she attempts to fight Sukuna while enraged by Mimiko's death. Neither of these deaths are that important, and they mostly aim to tie up some of the loose ends from Jujutsu Kaisen Zero. The next death, however, is important, and that's Jogo's. After Sukuna makes a wager with the spirit, the two engage in a battle that does some pretty major damage to Shibuya. While Jogo does put on a show and proves himself to be quite strong, he's still no match for Sukuna and is unable to land even one hit. In his final moments, he thinks only of his friends who he watched die, and they all sort of realize that they have no choice but to put their faith in Mahito, as he is the last one of the curses remaining. Sukuna then gives Jogo a message of praise, saying that the cursed spirit is actually quite strong, before he is incinerated and sent to the plane of non-existence for reincarnation. Ironically, the last person Sukuna kills is probably the weakest, and that's Haruda. Haruda was originally left alive by Sukuna, so the battle with Maharaga would not end, but he did suffer damage from a malevolent shrine, which ended up being enough to do him in. And honestly, thank god. Never been so happy to see a character die before. Good riddance. Unfortunately, I cannot see the same for the next two characters. Because next we have Nanami. After sustaining major damage from his fight with Dagon and then getting burnt alive by Jogo, Nanami has the misfortune of running into Mahito. These two have a history, but at this point it's clear to both of them that Nanami is in no position to fight. Instead he thinks of the future and a possibility of vacation. He chooses to go south, leaving the fate of the Jujutsu universe in the hands of Yuji Itadori, who arrives with perfect timing to watch one of his mentors die. Nanami always gave off the vibe of one of those characters that wasn't supposed to die. He was a character that didn't feel important enough or powerful enough to be worth killing off, and I think that is precisely why he did die in that moment. It was a moment to display that the salaryman had found peace in knowing that he had tried his hardest, and a moment to display the pure evil that is Mahito. And Mahito is not done. Shortly after, Mahito would claim another life. After his body double enters combat with Nabara, he realizes what a threat the female student actually is. He decides to use the double to draw her into the station, and after swapping positions with it, the real Mahito makes contact with her. This one touch is enough to kill her, and she would also leave Yuji a dying message, saying that it wasn't all bad, insinuating that she did not regret becoming a Jujutsu sorcerer. She did make some great friends, and have some fun experiences. There's a small cohort of fans that still think she's alive, but I personally am not one of them. She's just been gone for far too long. At this point, Mahito is likely the most hated character in Jujutsu Kaisen, but don't worry because he doesn't last much longer. After an arduous fight with Toto and Yuji, Mahito finds himself on the back foot. Out of cursed energy and out of transfigured humans, he is out of options as Yuji starts to hunt him down. Unfortunately, this hunter never gets his prey, as it is an apex predator that gets in his way. Mahito is quickly absorbed by Kinchu 
Kenjaku and used in Maximum Uzumaki. This Maximum technique destroys the cursed spirits involved and extracts their technique, which was then used by Kenjaku in order to start the Calling Games. As a result of the injuries he sustained in Shibuya, Naobito dies shortly after the incident. The now deceased leader of the Zenin clan leaves a will which is used to determine the next head of the clan. While it is initially expected to be Noya, Ogi, or Jinichi, this is now what happens due to a clause in the will, in which it is dictated that if Gojo Satoru is killed or incapacitated in some way, the next clan head will be Megumi. The exact reason for this clause is not really clear, but it appears to be an attempt at repairing relations between the two clans via a channel that is seen favorably by both sides. Another death that happens as a result of the Shibuya incident is Masamichi's. After being framed for collaborating with Gojo in creating the Shibuya incident, Masamichi is given the death sentence and Gakuganji is the one tasked with killing him. We don't know exactly how this fight goes, but it does result in Masamichi's death. With his dying breath, he puts a curse on Gakuganji, and it is a curse of knowledge, as he shares his method for creating sentient cursed corpses with the old man. After this, we move to the Zenin estate, where we have a lot of deaths to cover, starting with the death of Mai. Both her and Maki attempt to fight their father, Ogi, but neither of them are strong enough to beat him. This results in the twins being cast into the training room, which Ogi believes will be enough to finish them off. While there, Mai and Maki have a conversation in which it is revealed that because Mai exists, Maki will never reach her full potential. The opposite is also true, but because Maki wants to become stronger and has always been the more driven of the two, Mai decides to sacrifice herself to create a new cursed tool for Maki, and to allow Maki to fully utilize her heavenly restriction. But there is one condition to her sacrifice. Maki must destroy everything. And so... She does. Starting with her own father, who was startled to see Maki alive and emanating the same aura as Toji. The old man now stands no chance against the stronger sorcerer and is cut down easily in one swing of her sword. This is the formal beginning of the Zenin clan massacre, which is carried out solely by Maki. She starts by killing a number of unnamed members of the Kukuru, which raises the alarms for the Hai to engage. The first two Hai to die are Chojuru and Nobuaki. These two attempt at attacking Maki by using Chojuru's technique to get in close, but his technique alone is not enough to give them the win over the newly awakened sorcerer, so she easily rips out their throats. Technically, we don't see these two die, but I think this is enough of an implication. The next to enter combat are Jinichi and Ranta. These two plan to use Ranta's technique to immobilize Maki and Jinichi's technique to flatten her. Unfortunately, this doesn't really work out, and Jinichi gets beheaded by Maki while she takes minimal damage. Ranta, on the other hand, seems to get killed by overexerting himself via his cursed technique. The last person killed in the massacre is Noya, but he is not killed by Maki. While he does lose the fight to her after she figures out his technique, technique, Maki lets him live. This is most likely done unintentionally, but it does result in Noya being killed by a non-sorcerer, specifically Maki's mom. Because Noya was not killed using cursed energy, he did not truly die, and instead is reincarnated as a cursed spirit known as Cursed Noya. While this form is much stronger and much faster than his human body, the result of his rematch with Maki is pretty much the same. This is mainly because he casts his technique without realizing that Maki cannot be detected by it, as she is considered an object due to her lack of cursed energy. This allows her to sneak up on Noya and end him with one stab, officially killing the most sexist sorcerer. Remember the non-sorcerer that originally killed Noya? Well, it was actually Maki and Mai's mom, and it appears that she also died right after killing the young sorcerer. Next, we move into the Culling Games, where the first person to die is Chizuru, who is killed by Megumi after getting in the way of his mission. Registar also dies to Megumi after an intense battle, which he ultimately loses due to underestimating the student. In his death, he wishes that fate toys with Megumi before he dies like a fool. In the Sendai Colony, we have a pseudo off-screen death in Daruv, who is quickly dispatched by Yuta upon entering the colony. This death actually leads to the second death in Sendai, which is Kurowushi. After fighting with Yuta one-on-one -on -one for a couple of chapters, Kurowushi looks to be on the edge of victory after injecting Yuta with insects and cutting open his stomach with the festering life blade. But it was ultimately a trap, and Yuta uses this moment to give Kurowushi a big ol' kiss, and in the process breathes reverse cursed energy directly into the spirit's mouth. This kills the special grade on the spot, but prior to this death, Kurushi created a second body for itself with the goal of living on if it did get defeated. This allows the curse to come back right at the peak of the free-for-all, and it sneaks into the three-way domain battle, ultimately destabilizing it. However, this effort is ultimately futile, as the curse does end up dying regardless. That's the last death in Sendai for now, so we're going to be moving into Tokyo 2, where we have two pseudo-deaths. Both of Panda's siblings were killed by Kashimo while engaging in combat. It's unclear if these were even alive in the 
the first place, and neither of them played too big of a role in the story, but their deaths are still tearjerkers for sure. And now, we have one of the more disappointing deaths in Jujutsu Kaisen, that of Yuki Sakumo, the first special grade sorcerer. After a long and brutal battle with Kenjaku, Yuki ultimately loses because Kenny reveals that he can create mini Uzumakis which pack a strong punch. A single one is enough to blow a hole clear through her middle, and after her body collapses, she has no choice but to sacrifice herself to create a black hole in a last ditch effort to kill Kenjaku. But it is ultimately in vain due to Kenjaku having an anti-gravity technique, which is essentially the perfect counter to a black hole. All that was left behind by her was her book about souls, and we don't really have any information on it as of yet. After the students collect all the points they need in the Cullen games, they gather to spend them in order to save Sumiki. However, it doesn't really go as planned, because Sumiki has been overridden by another sorcerer, Yozuru. When a reincarnated sorcerer takes over the body of an existing person, their soul is essentially overwritten. This means there is no way to separate the new sorcerer from the old, and it also means that the original owner of the body ceases to exist. But if that doesn't convince you that she's dead, don't worry, her body will be dead in just a second too. But first, we have to talk about another one of Sukuna's victims. This time, it's Ryu, another reincarnated sorcerer. This is another character that mostly just got unlucky, as he just happened to be in the wrong place in Sendai at the exact moment that Sukuna would be traveling there. He didn't stand a chance and lost without landing a single hit. Sukuna was in Sendai for one single reason, and that was because he wanted to face Yozuru. He believed that forcing his vessel, Megumi, to kill the body of his sister would sink his soul deeper into the shadows, allowing Sukuna to gain full control over Megumi's body. The duo fight for a while, but Sukuna does ultimately win, leading to Yozuru's death. Much like Mai's death, Yozuru uses the last of her life to create a cursed weapon for Sukuna, a replica of Kamutoke. She also tried to teach Sukuna about love, and this would go on to be a major theme for his character. Shortly after this battle, Gojo is unsealed, and just that action leads to a number of deaths. The first few do not have names, and they also do not have faces. It's the higher-ups of Jujutsu society. We don't know anything about them, but they were killed by someone, who is also still unknown. A lot of people seem to think it was either Gojo or Maki, but honestly, it could have been anyone. The next death is also caused by Gojo's unsealing, and it's, well, his own. Gojo put up a very commendable fight against Sukuna, beating Maharaga and Ejito in the process while forcing Sukuna into a corner by disabling his domain and forcing him to fight in close combat, which is much more of Gojo's comfort zone. But late into the fight, Maharaga made an adaptation to Gojo's infinity, which used Sukuna's technique as a blueprint. This essentially gave Sukuna the ability to cut through the space something is in, rather than cutting the object itself. It lets Sukuna bypass abilities and durability, therefore letting him get through infinity. This one slash led to Gojo getting cut in half, and as far as we can tell, he's not coming back. Sure, there is cope, and sure, it is technically possible, but it seems very unlikely at this point. Gojo's death is the last death that seems like a death, but there are three ambiguous cases that have happened since this fight that I also want to talk about. The first one is Megumi. When Sukuna was using Megumi's body, we periodically got looks at Megumi as if he was sulking at the bottom of his soul, but since Sukuna reverted back to his primal form, we have not seen Megumi a single time. Considering that Sukuna needed Megumi's vessel specifically for the technique, it seems like shedding his vessel led to Megumi's death. But it is still pretty ambiguous due to not having any kind of confirmation from Sukuna or Yuji or anyone. There is also a lot of ambiguity surrounding Kashimo, because after his thrashing by Sukuna, he faces down a grate of dismantle that seems unavoidable. But right before it hits, both him and Sukuna go into a flashback and talk about love for a little bit. When Sukuna returns to the real world, Kashimo is nowhere to be seen. It seems seems very likely that he was killed, but much like Megumi, he kind of just disappeared. The final unconfirmed death is Takiba, whose death is pretty new. His conversation with Kenjaku in their comedy club did kind of make it seem like he was dying because he didn't want it to end, but like, first of all, what killed him? And second of all, he could actually just be talking about his comedy routine. Regardless, once the comedy routine ends, he's just kind of lying there, and it seems like he's dead. But he could also just be napping. I mean, the dude just spent three chapters altering reality, so there's no way he's not tired. I really hope that he is just taking like a little nappy nap, but only time will tell. And that's everyone. I think. There are probably a few unnamed characters in here that I forgot or something, but they're not really important. If you enjoyed, please consider subscribing. It would really mean a lot to me. We just hit 20,000 subscribers, and I just want to say thank you to everyone that has subscribed so far. Truly, thank you so much. Check out another video, and I'll see you again soon in a little while.